so it's, it's a really great pleasure be, to be doing this. Um, 10 years seems like a, a tremendously long time, or, but actually a, a blink of an eye. Um, and actually, I've taken my final executive decision today, and that is A, to stand down here where it feels a little bit more friendly, uh, and also to make sure that this sticks to 20 minutes. So I'm going to ask Michael <laughs> to give me a five-minute warning because I, I really want to keep this moving, and I, I know you're all pretty desperate to get home, probably a bit tired from last night. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little romp through 10 years of simulation-based education through the ASPE lens, okay? Um, I always like to start with a, with a little bit of background about, about why I'm here. This is, this is my sixth visit to Ireland. I, I love it here. It's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, people are so welcoming, and it never rains. So <laughs> I, arrived, I arrived on Friday night. There was a little bit of low cloud, I think I'll call it, on Friday night. But um, Saturday, I, I had my Game of Thrones experience, uh, and all of it was stunning. So there I am at Ballantoy and, uh, and then at the Giants Causeway. Just amazing. So, so thank you, Ireland, for that again. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, of, little bit of the background of simulation-based education, and then I'm going to focus on some current priorities as I see it for simulation-based education and focus really just on three areas. Faculty development, which I know we all feel strongly about, research and innovation, and patient safety. And through all of that, I'll be exploring the role of this organization. So I thought it'd be apposite to use a quote from an, a native born. So C.S. Lewis, uh, as Mike told us uh, on Monday, was from Belfast. And when I was putting this talk together, I was sort of thinking, you know, I've been in simulation quite a long time. I'm not really sure that it feels hugely different. But actually, having the opportunity to look back and really think about where, where we've come from and, and what we've done in this organization and this fantastic community um, was a great joy and really revealed to me that it's a hell of a lot different. So probably one of the first important documents that came out focusing our minds on simulation, at least on the mainland, was the Chief Medical Officer of England's 150-year celebratory report in which he included a chapter on patient safety. Um, and he told us, apparently, that simulation works. I'm not quite sure in 2008 that he actually had the evidence to support that, certainly in healthcare. I think he was extrapolating from other industries. And I do like this little graphic that was in the document. And I don't know if you can see it. The light's a little bit tricky at the moment. But the ratio of simulators to pilots in civil aviation was somewhat greater than it is in healthcare. I realize that it's only doctors that are, are mentioned on this, but fewer than 20 high fidelity simulators uh, on the mainland at that time. Uh, that has, of course, changed quite a bit, but still the ratio is not looking that great. So <clears throat> the next step, a framework for technology enhanced learning, in which Dame Sally Davis, Liam Donaldson's successor, said, yep, simulation is good. Yep, we should be doing more of it. OK, fantastic. What were we doing as an organization at that stage? Well, we'd not been around that long, but under Bryn Baxendale's leadership, uh, we decided that we were going to do a, a national simulation development project. Um, I'm sure Bryn would agree that was quite hard work. I remember quite a lot of early morning emails and scurrying around and fretting. Um, it was an enormous piece of work, which he led with, with Andy Anderson and our simulation development officers all across the UK uh, and Northern Ireland. And so the two key things that came out of that, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, were this issue of variability in support for faculty around the regions and also a lack of any quality assurance anywhere in simulation-based education at the time. <clears throat> then in 2016, um, the Commission on Education um, for Patient Safety produced this document in which they really start to focus on the importance of simulation as a tool to support safe practice, uh, which, of course, we all believe quite firmly. So that was helpful as well. And then Health Education England, just this year, produced this document in which they described the operational response to that strategic document that was, that was produced three years before. And what they've said in this, and I would encourage you to take a look at it, is, look, we have come quite a long way in SBE in the UK, but arguably there's still quite a lot more we could be doing. 
So, and out of this, just, just before this, HE, probably the most important document in recent times, has come out. Our National Framework for Simulation-Based Education, which ASPE was, was closely involved in. And this highlights five core principles, and I'm only going to focus on a couple of them in the, in the time that I have today. And I think at the time, I think most of us in this room would have thought, oh, great, great, this is, this is good. This is more grist to the mill. Yes, simulation is important. We need to be doing more of it. But actually, there was also a bit of me thinking, oh, my Lord, this is a big deal. We've got a lot of work to do if this is really going to happen. If we're going to have simulation across all curricula for all healthcare professionals, we've got a lot to do. So let's think briefly then about faculty development. And within this um, SDO project, just to go back to it, what the core finding was this issue of problem supporting faculty. And on the back of that also, this lack of, of quality assurance. No standards available for people to measure themselves against or, or, or programs of education to be measured against. And that was deemed to be an incredibly important priority for us as an organization. Other challenges facing faculty, frankly, in any form of medical education, but we're here thinking about simulation, are also that we are now training healthcare professionals to deal with cohorts of patients with vastly increased comorbidities, an aging population. And on top of that, increased complexity of care and care pathways, all against a backdrop, a backdrop of resource constraints. And frankly, the woefully inadequate workforce planning from central government in healthcare, which has led to many, many problems with recruitment and retention. I know you feel my pain. But I quite like this figure as well. The other issue that gives me you know, some degree of anxiety is the amount of medical knowledge that's out there and how quickly it is progressing. And so by 2020, it is projected that in just 73 days, medical knowledge will double. It's quite frightening. So what are we doing as an organization to support faculty development, this thing that we feel so strongly about? Well, we offer the IRIS platform for, for free to members of the organization, which is an incredibly supportive way to develop your scenarios in a, in a wider community of practice. We are uh, piloting in this country a novel faculty development program which was developed in Monash University by Deborah Nestel's group. And again, Bryn and the guys at Trent have worked really closely with them to bring it to this country, and it is being piloted in many areas. I do believe that there are still some slots available. I'm just looking at Bryn, he's nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. If you're interested, please get in touch. And then, of course, in 2016, we delivered on the standards front. So this piece of work, again, uh, extremely challenging, led by Perva, supported by all the exec and by Health Education England. Um, and actually now, as we saw last night, the accreditation process that sits alongside that is working really well. Uh, and we saw our first program accreditation last night, so congratulations to, to those guys. Moving on to research and innovation. I think every year at this conference, I am astounded at developments. Our colleagues in, and industry, industry partners are just doing the most amazing job developing tools for us to use in simulated learning environments. And I think that sometimes that can feel a little bit overwhelming. You know, a bit, a bit like this idea of all this knowledge coming, what am, I gonna, what am I gonna do with it? And I quite like this little graphic that was, was out in the Twitter feed from IHI not so very long ago. And it really kind of highlights the issue we face with where we are in terms of practice, what we're doing uh, in education, and what we know. And you can see that that gap is widening, and, and I, I, we feel it. I see it uh, in that exhibition hall out there. So where is the evidence to su support what we're doing, and why is that important? I think most of us would empathize with this um, emotion that, that David Gabber is, is, is expressing in this statement. You know, it works, you know, other people are using it. Why don't we just do that? But actually, I don't want this just to be an opinion. And I think most of us in this room would agree. And judging by the research program this year, um, it's very clear that we all believe research is important. And so the data, you'll, you'll recognize these studies on simulation to support skills training. 
Um, and Paul gave a great talk yesterday on where we're at with, with uh, simulation-based education research, and then work on team training. And there's a really nice narrative review, if any of you haven't seen it, by Sally Weaver, looking at what's out there in terms of evidence for team training, showing that there are now data to support patient outcomes improving as a result of robust team training interventions. And just a little bit more up-to-date work from, um, from BOE and from uh, uh, Eduardo Salas' groups. And I've just extrapolated using the same search criteria from Sally Weaver's paper to show you what I mean by the amount of data that's being produced now. So a huge amount more work on team training is going on around the world, and that's exciting, and hopefully will inform the way we intelligently apply simulation-based education for our, um, for our healthcare professionals. But here's another issue that I think we have in faculty development, and that is all of us are attempting to assess healthcare professionals on a daily basis, whether that's in a formative or a summative or even a regulatory um, setting, as Ruth was talking about yesterday. And so we were sitting down thinking, you know, that there's a bit of a problem here with non-technical skills. I'm interested in assessing non-technical skills. And I've been brought up on the ANT system. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder, you know, I really should have a think. I'm, you know, I'm doing my thesis. I should have a think about how, what's out there. What does it look like across the healthcare professions? And I, I, while I was thinking, I think, oh, probably, there'll probably be about 25 or so of these tools. So it shouldn't be, shouldn't be too difficult. And uh, 11,450 odd papers later, I discovered that there are 76 different non-technical skills assessment tools. These are observer-based assessment tools across different healthcare settings. And in the same um, edition of, of BMJ Quality and Safety, another systematic re review looking specifically at team per performance tools for, for crisis situations. And it's this question here that came out of the editorial that went with it why aren't we there yet, that I think is the crux of the issue, and perhaps something that we as an organization ought, ought to be seeking to answer. There needs to be a rationalization of how we are doing this. And it was highlighted again yesterday by Ruth, similar issues in the number of debriefing tools that are out there. Too many, too confusing. How do we expect novices to simulation-based education to pick one? What's the best one? Which do I use? Oh, well, I might as well just make one up myself. That's not helpful. And so, of course, ASPE now has a platform for exploring these sorts of issues. In 2014, uh, our journal, BMJ Stell, came out. Um, we are uh, now indexed on Scopus. We have a new editor, Deborah Nestel, who's got exciting plans for the future. Nick Sefdalis did a great job getting us where we are. And we're now going to move to six uh, editions a year from 2020. So, you know, research in simulation-based education is improving, and ASPE has provided a platform for us to um, share these innovations. Now, patient safety. Um, several people have alluded to this document, which came out in the summer this year, the new NHS patient safety strategy. And again, what they're saying is, yes, simulation is an important learning tool in this domain. We should be using it. Okay, great. But actually, where are we in safety at the moment? How far you know, have, we got, have we got to go? Is there a lot to do? Is there a little bit to do? And I really like this graphic from, um, from Robin Ferner's paper, in which he really describes healthcare as being far more akin to bungee jumping than to traveling by rail, which is unfortunate. Um, and the early studies, in which you'll all remember it was estimated that one in 200 people would die as a direct result of an adverse incident. This was from Lucy Neap's group, and then similar studies around the world in developed healthcare systems, same sort of results. Where are we now? Well, actually, not a huge difference. In fact, Macquarie's group at Johns Hopkins are now saying that medical error is the third biggest cause of death in the United States. And then there's interesting data on medication error um, from, the, from the UK as well. Quite scary numbers. And so I would agree with Charles Vincent when he says, look, there are pockets of excellent activity in patient safety, often using simulation. But actually, 
There's no sustained, consistent evidence across systems about what patient safety interventions work, and we need to try much harder to fix that. So I'm going to focus now just briefly on an area where I think we're not getting, right, getting it right in patient safety and where I think simulation can help. And so incident analysis is something I feel strongly about. I'm asked to do quite a lot of it in my organization. And in 2015, a select committee reported that processes for investigating and learning from incidents in the NHS really weren't up to much. And that actually, the quality of our investigation falls far short of what should be expected. And on the back of this report in 2017, our new healthcare safety investigation branch came into being. And my colleague Dawn, sitting at the front here, is a, is a member of their team, which gives me cause for great hope. So I'd just like to take you over why I think we're not getting this right. This, this is an event, a critical incident that I investigated recently in my organization. I refuse to call it a never event. I'm going to use the American nomenclature. It's a sentinel event, something we should be learning from. So patient comes in for removal of a skin lesion. Lesion isn't marked. There's no computer screen in theater. Hard for the patient con to confirm the lesion because it's on his back. <coughs> Excuse me. And the WHO is done inadequately. And then the wrong lesion is removed. What a bunch of idiots. Except that it's always more like this. A series of task and system problems, cultural and behavioral issues, issues, and usually a little bit of bad luck. So the paradigm shift that has occurred in high reliability organizations where Instead of asking who did that, they say, how did this happen? So that in the old situation, you know, that paradigm shift, sorry, has not occurred in healthcare yet. The old view where human error is seen as a cause of failure, you know, the who did that thing, should be looking more like the human error has been caused by systemic problems, problems with processes and pathways and so forth that are just not fit for purpose. Saying what people did is quite satisfying from the standpoint of an investigator. But saying what people should have done, if you like, doesn't really explain why in that moment, in the context in which they were working, it made sense to them at the time. Now, how many of you have had an email from your medical director saying, now, um, there's been a very terrible incident on Ward 8A. Uh, Mrs. Smith had the wrong dose of insulin given and she had a serious hypoglycemic event, and I would appreciate it if you could all be far more careful when you're prescribing insulin. Yours sincerely. Doesn't help. Only by constantly looking for vulnerabilities in organizations can we enhance safety. Now, I realize this is all thinking about what's gone wrong, and I'm a staunch advocate of celebrating excellence and thinking about what goes right and the safety to um, it is terrifically important, but actually, we're not getting this right at all. We're not even learning from the things that are going wrong yet properly, and we need to fix that. So I'm going to give you a very quick example of some work we've been doing in Thames Valley, training external reviewers from trusts around our region to look at other trusts' incidents, <coughs> excuse me, using a human factors lens. So this is a story of a woman, a complicated history, Unfortunately, the premature delivery by emergency cesarean section resulted in a neonatal death. So a, a horrible incident. I just want you to look now, you don't need to read all this, but I want you to look at the difference between the findings in the internal report and the findings in the external report. So for a start, there are more in the external report. More isn't always better, but in this case it is. And I want you to look on the left-hand side at how many times the finger is pointed at the junior midwife. And it's also the case that in the internal report, they focused only on the final hours in which she arrived in the maternity unit and the disaster happened. There was no consideration of the quality of her antenatal care, which was a big part of the problem. And then if we come on to recommendations, um, in the internal review, again, you'll see that there are fewer, and in the external review, more and richer. On this side, in the internal review, you get an awful lot more 
an awful lot more. All my friends here look. Five more minutes. Okay, I can do it. I can do it. Five more minutes. Um, so on the left-hand side, a lot more. Let's have a meeting and discuss what went wrong. Send someone on a course. Brilliant. Uh, and make that registrar do a reflective piece. I mean, seriously. If you think about the hierarchy of recommendations, I like this from the uh, Canadian framework, but actually I disagree with their view on training. What they're describing as training is what I've just shown you. Send that person on a course, it'll all be fine. What we mean by training is well-designed, low-dose, high-frequency, experiential interventions that will make a difference to teams like this. So in, to come back, back to intelligent use of, C, of SBE, I think we see quite a bit of that in skills and team training. But where we're missing a trick now, I feel, is in patient and pathway, system and device uh, testing, and care closer to home, because that's what's coming. And at the moment, most of the simulation is going on in theatres, intensive cares, and EDs. So I, I'm sure you'll all feel my pain when I say that I chair the committee, the NAPSIPS committee in my hospital. And I do agree with their mantra, standardize, harmonize, educate, especially with the educate bit. And I'll just go back to that dermatology incident that I told you about. We are using simulation with that incredibly responsive and proactive team in dermatology. They've utterly redesigned their WHO checklist. And we are using simulation and ethnography to help them embed it properly in practice. Only then do checklists work. And then some of the work that we're doing in primary care Yes, we're delivering simulation. A lot of people do that in primary care. There's some great stuff going on. But we've designed cognitive aids based very much along the lines of the work in Ariadne Labs and then the AAGVI's new quick reference handbook to support safe practice in primary care when acutely unwell patients come through the door. All of these documents, just to come on to my final, the final B in my bonnet, public and patient involvement. All of these documents support it. They say we must be doing it. I would like to highlight again that I am so delighted this year that this organization has a, achieved patients included accreditation. And to thank Dawn and Bill, who I think is at the back there, and William, who was unable to stay today, for all the help they gave us in making sure that this happened. It is a vital part of what we do going forward, and I'm delighted that Carrie Hamilton will be taking over from me. So rather interestingly, I noticed that my original title said, and a strategy for the future. And I thought, oh, blimey, that sounds a bit pompous. It's not up to me to say what the strategy for the future is. My strategy for the future is you, all of you in this audience, this amazing multi-professional community who are all passionate about delivering high quality education to support safe practice in healthcare. I know you're going to fix it, and I'm going to enjoy watching it from the sidelines. I also want to remind you that this is an organization where we have a lot of fun. Yes, Bryn, that's you with a fork in your face again. <laughs> so there's, it's important to have fun. It's important to network and, and be together. And that's what we do well. My final slide, thank you again to Ireland. I love being here. Appreciate your time. Any questions can be asked later. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, the moment we've all been waiting for. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so guys and girls, uh, we'll just stop you there. That's okay. Um, we'll just we'll just hold you there, Anna. If that's all right. <laughs> um, so if you want to just yeah, and um, bring the bring the core team up beside you, sure. And we'll give them one big last uh, round of applause, please, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so the judges have deliberated and made their decision. Again, they would like to commend the extremely high quality of the performances, uh, both technical and non-technical skills demonstrated uh, uh, impeccably from both teams. But the decision has been made. It's been a difficult decision, but it's a unanimous decision for the winners. I will announce the second place team first uh, to receive their plaques and commendation for an outstanding tournament. So in second place, is the Maple Syrup Squad from University College Cork. The winners are the Emergency Care AMPs from Jordanstown. And so, winning the prizes, which includes a one-year scholarship, a free subscription to the Association of Medical Education Europe, provided by our sponsors, AMI, and our individualized winner's plaques, and our lovely trophy for their unit. It is the winners, the very deserving winners, of the Aspie Sim Wars 2019 competition. It's the Emergency Care ANPs from University of Ulster. Just working, that's better. Um, so now just the awards then for the various uh, different parts of the um, abstracts, posters, that kind of stuff. So I've got a glamorous uh, assistant here. Thank you very much. I should be the assistant with a name like Money Penny. Um, so the best poster presentation is awarded to Sarah Fairbairn, if she's still in the room. Okay, so we're, we're cooking with gas here. I'm going to announce the best short communication presentation goes to Scarlett Herbertson. Is she, is she here? And the best oral presentation is awarded to Ben McNaughton. And then last but definitely not least, the best workshop, uh, deservedly so, awarded to Nicola Weatherup.
Um, so we're almost there, you'll be glad to know. I just have a small announcement to make about next year, if you're wondering where we're heading off to. So we are heading off to... Yay, there we go. Birmingham next year. Please save the date. Uh, and for those who weren't successful this time around, you know you can see the abstract submissions open up on the 9th of March. So I look forward to seeing you all there. That's not the end, though. I'm just going to pass over to Marion Trainer uh, for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say a few words just um, to end the conference. And basically, uh, we've had a fantastic three days. And we will, when we look back at the number of workshops, lectures, um, sim wars, uh, and discussions over the past two days, the thought that strikes me is that successful conferences do not close. They just open up new opportunities for us, um, new, new ideas. And although we are now heading in our own directions and returning to our work, etc. Um, the collective body of knowledge, understanding, and skills which we have unearthed here in Belfast will continue to grow as new opportunities present themselves for developing the theory and practice of simulation. I think there's excellent um, energy and ideas coming forward, and it's, it's going to be wonderful, wonderful to see. Generating those opportunities and sharing them between us obviously does not have to wait until next year's conference in, in Birmingham. Um, while it is important for those of us involved in simulation to come together on occasions like this, we recognize that through electronic media, social media, we can continue to share our ideas, our research, and our findings throughout the year. So that the work of ASBE can be seen as a continuous process, uh, and that's important. This means that the research connections and opportunities for collaboration can be presented then at next year's conference, and we hope to see many of you there. The opportunities we identified this year include our growing patient involvement, the interprofessional focus of simulation, the role of technicians in supporting simulation, and our growing student body who have embraced simulation as a learning strategy. And I think that's been evident throughout the workshops, throughout um, the, 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 the most recent event, and, uh, and that's, that's wonderful to see. Of course, none of this would have, been, would have been possible without the professionalism, the expertise, and the experience of those who contributed to our discussions over the past two days. I wish to thank all of them for traveling to Belfast, and not just for sharing their knowledge with us, but for doing so with the enthusiasm, the dedication, and the passion, which is the hallmark of great researchers. And that, that was wonderful to see. But stimulating lectures and workshops and discussions need more than just good speakers and facilitators. They need an eager and interested audience, people who are willing to listen and then to share their expertise and experience to a wider group. And in that respect, I have to pay tribute to every single person who attended this conference. All of you have been at workshops, and it was just exceptional to see the, the, the eagerness and the willingness to participate, to question, and to discuss. So conferences are planned by organizers, but shaped by delegates. And I think that, that was very obvious. You, the 500 delegates who, shared this, who shaped this conference into a memorable three days by your commitment to advance the cause of simulation in healthcare for the benefit of society. And I should have some pictures, maybe not. No, okay, not to worry. I thought we had some snaps of various workshops. Oh, we do, sorry, is that it? Or do I keep going? Oh, there we are. Sorry, apologies. Okay, so hopefully you can see some of you and your participation, which is, <laughs> is good. Um, whilst you're watching that, I would like to thank ASBE for agreeing to have their 10th anniversary conference in Belfast. We were truly delighted when that letter came through. And, uh, and uh, also thank you to Visit Belfast, the exhibitors, Queen's University, and the Northern Ireland Simulation and Human Factors Network and the Irish Association for Simulation, all of whom contributed to, to the success. And to reiterate what Perver said in her opening address, 
Involvement, innovation and improvement should be our goal. My message today is that we might return to our places of learning and clinic clinical work to prepare for enhanced role for simulation in healthcare. <laughs> this conference has shown that the role of simulation has expanded over recent decades and it has also shown that expansion is continuing in many new areas across a broad spectrum of healthcare. On behalf of Queen's University, I pledge our continued support for investment in the valuable work of simulation, and we look forward to cooperating with many of you in a wide range of institutions to bring the benefits of our efforts to the wider world. As many of you know, Queen's University will be opening a new world-class simulation center in 2020 with a specific focus on interprofessional education. We recognize that if healthcare is a global challenge, it can only be met by global collaboration. So instead of just calling this conference to a close, let us agree that one of the primary opportunities we identified here in Belfast is the opportunity to work together to create a better world. So thank you for attending. Enjoy the pictures. Thank you to John for putting that together for me. And I look forward to seeing you in Birmingham next year. Thank you.